studio sessions for Arnold Lane and its B-side Candy and a Current Bun ran from the 23rd to the 25th of January 1967, then continued on Sunday the 29th and wrapped on Tuesday the 31st and Wednesday the 1st of February, the day Pink Floyd signed to EMI. Joe Boyd had been working as a producer for Electra Records and had tried to sign the band to the label in 1966, but his bosses weren't interested. When he left the record company in September that year, Joe, as an independent producer, tried to get them a deal elsewhere. Polydor was interested, and there was a track record at that label for signing deals with maverick producers, such as Robert Stigwood and Kit Lambert. They'd take the money offered by the label and in return deliver albums by artists such as the Bee Gees and The Who. Joe Boyd's Witch Season Production Company was set up and ready to go with a similar Polydor deal for Pink Floyd. But the plan was scuppered when the group brought in a new agency to look after their affairs, and Pink Floyd famously inked that deal with EMI. Joe, as an independent, knew the band's new record company used their own in-house producers and would therefore be surplus to requirements in the future, but he was given the funds to produce this first Pink Floyd single, Arnold Lane, as an independent production. And it wasn't recorded at the famous Abbey Road. Boyd and Floyd cut the A and B side at Sound Techniques in Chelsea, with the assistance of Sound Techniques engineer John Wood. Now, Steve, that's the background to the recording, and I'm delighted to say this is the first of our exposés today, because we have four track recordings dating from that Sunday session, January 29th, 1967. What can we discover here? Well, I made the most fascinating discovery when I actually found the tape box. It's worth noting that in the 60s, during the four-track era, tracks were of such a premium that after the backing track was recorded over the four tracks, a submix or dub down as they used to call it was made combining those four tracks to either another machine or a separate piece of tape and then opening up three more tracks. So they bounce them all down to one. Correct. Right. But on this reel I've discovered something I think is far more interesting. It's actually the original backing track of the session. So we can tell exactly what was recorded on the backing track because just prior to the master take, which was take three, there are two little outtakes. So listen very carefully to this. So I can tell that the original backing track and confirmed with Joe was drums and bass recorded onto one track, Sid's guitar recorded onto a second track, and Rick's keyboard, in this case an organ, was recorded onto the third track, leaving one spare track, which they then overdubbed some acoustic guitars. But just have a listen. You'll also hear, if you listen carefully, that it sounds like Nick hits one of the microphones with his drumstick, which is why they had to start the take again. And that's where it stops. Yes. So that's the backing track without the effects by the sound of it? Yes, that's the very raw, dry, clean sound of the backing track being recorded. So if we move the tape along a little bit to take three, which was actually the master take, you'll hear engineer John Wood start the recording. And now I will solo what was and is the master drum and bass track on the final record. This is recorded on one single track. So next, I'd like to isolate the guitar track. The recording process used to create this guitar sound was very unusual and certainly revolutionary for 1967. When I spoke to Joe about this, he then telephoned John Wood and we got the exact story of the process. They were just in LA starting to use direct recording of electric instruments and John Wood was kind of intrigued by this and he talked to Jeff Frost who was the boffin who who owned the studio or was partners in the studio and who built the boards and they went down to some used GPO parts outlet on Lyle Street and got some gadgets and ended up with alligator clips on the back of the guitar amp that went directly into the board. And the sound on Sid's guitar is a blend of what the mic was picking up in front of the amp and what this weird DI that they'd invented was picking up directly off the back of the amp. So that was the first time anybody had heard of a direct injection? 
Well, we know that direct injection had been used during the 60s, but from the instrument. What's very unusual about this is they were taking a feed from the guitar amplifier, i.e. capturing the tone of the amplification and any of the delay effects that Sid was using, because Sid was very keen on experimenting with guitar sounds that you almost take for granted today, using tape delay and strange reverb. But this is very, very revolutionary stuff for 1967. Next, I'd like to isolate the organ. Now, this was recorded with the original backing track, but the solo was overdubbed later and punched in on the same track. Now, the sound of this solo is very important to the overall feel of this recording. Here's Joe again. The idea of this spacey keyboard solo was a kind of nod in the direction of what they did live, and also the fact that they wanted it to sound the way they did live. I mean, there was no feeling like, oh, we want to sort of change ourselves and change our sound. They wanted to keep the record sounding as much like them as possible. So that's the organ. Now, we now have a completed backing track with one final addition on this original four track, and that's the acoustic guitar. So here's a little bit of the acoustic guitars. So now we have a tape completely full. There's nowhere else to go. So those four tracks have to be combined to a single track in order to make three more tracks. And this is generally done by playing back the four tracks and copying them to a, another machine, either another four track machine or in some cases just to a mono machine to create a mono track. So that entire thing is going down a generation. OK, so we've got four tracks bounced down to one, but we've still got three spare tracks on the new tape, yeah? That's correct. So that now allows room for more overdubs. The very next thing they wanted to overdub was the vocals. All right, first overdub, take two. So whilst listening to the mix of everything on track one in their headphones, Sid and Rick Wright are about to record their vocals on track two. Arnold Lane had a strange hobby Collecting clothes, moonshine, washing line. They suit him fine. So that'll be Sid on one microphone and Rick Wright on a second microphone. Those two microphones recorded onto a single track. And we're hearing that. You'll notice also Rick is singing unison in a couple of spots of this. Yep. And occasionally harmony. And they have to get this right. Yes, they've got to get it right because they couldn't easily punch in and out of record in between the lines like you could do today. It's not the same. And we can hear because of John's announcement at the start of each take that seven vocal takes were recorded. What they would do is just take the best take overall. What's very noticeable on the final record is that the lead vocal is double-tracked. That, again, was quite complicated to do in those days. The singers would have to perform the double-track live against their pre-recorded vocal so that the two vocal tracks would be combined onto a third track. It just goes to show how complicated recording was in the days of four-track. One of the memories I have of the mix that we did, and it's so hard to, you know, to imagine now, of course, you have automation and you can do all these little moves and everything perfected. But in those days, a mix was a, a take, you know, a, a one pass, and you had to get it all right on that time. And I was doing something, I think, with the vocals at the end of the chorus leading into the solo. And I was trying to do, you know, bring the, the organ track up at the beginning of the solo, as well as doing something with the vocal track. And Roger kind of said, look, I'll do that. Let me do that. I know exactly how I want it to sound. And so he was the one who, he reached over, I remember these huge Roger Waters hands kind of reaching over my shoulder, putting this big index finger on the organ track. And just at the right moment, sort of, putting it up just exactly the right number of dbs for that soar that happens at the beginning of the solo. Now he's caught a nasty 
Yeah. Lane gave Pink Floyd their first chart success when it reached the top 20 in the spring of 67, one of two hit singles for the group that year, the other being See Emily Play, which reached the top 10 that summer, but would be their final hit for another 12 years. Now, Steve, just before we move on from Arnold Lane, there's one other thing on these tapes that you found hidden between the takes. Well, as I was transferring the multitrack at Abbey Road, as the engineer was winding the tape back, I heard something that was different, and I said, stop, stop, let me hear what that is. And this is a work-in-progress version of Candy in the Current Bun. That was a B-side to Arnold Lane. It is the backing track, which ultimately became the B-side of Arnold Lane. But it's interesting historically because it's not the finished version. It is the actual track they use. But as we mentioned before with Arnold Lane, many copies were made to do the subsequent overdubs. But this one still has the isolated vocal tracks on it, mm. both the lead vocal and very curious backing vocals. in the sun go by candy and a current bun I like to see you running fly so who's doing the lead this is the early Pink Floyd sound of Sid doing the lead vocal with Rick doing this unison-y vocally harmony sound but it sounds like all of them on the backing vocal It's a very strange sound, and I still can't actually work out what they're doing. So what I think is historically fascinating about this discovery is quite clearly from a very, very early point in their recording career, they were experimenting with very unusual vocal sounds, especially on the backing vocals. Just a snippet of Candy and the Current Bun, the B-side to Arnold Lane, which along with C. Emily Play became the only two early hits for the group. Pink Floyd was not a singles band. There wouldn't be another British chart entry until Another Brick in the Wall, Part 2, and that was the tail end of 79. The group's strength lay in their albums and the innovation and experimentation they brought into the studio. These initial releases, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn and A Saucer Full of Secrets, were produced by the late Norman Smith. Nick Mason. Norman was an excellent engineer and had worked with the Beatles. And so I think the idea was very much that in the way that um, George Martin had become the producer for the Beatles, that Norman would now be taken from engineering and become the producer for the new wonder band. And I think he was terrific for us for that period because he was a little like George. He was a musician and he did have quite a lot of input. He can quite often be heard on harmony vocals and on backing tracks. He could certainly lay out a chord sequence, suggest different instruments and so on. 
he was very happy to teach rather than uh, protective in any way. So I think we all have fond memories of Norman until the point at which we then really wanted to uh, fly on our own. And I think there was a point at which Norman really wanted to stick to the sort of, the, I'd say, the pop song concept, whereas we wanted to head off into new territory. Set the controls for the heart of the sun from the 1968 album A Saucer Full of Secrets, which David Gilmour believes is the only track featuring all five members of the band and was released shortly after a turbulent period in their history, which saw the arrival of David and the departure of Sid. 